Awesome. Uh, so good to see you all. It's fun to be uh, together again. It's really nice to have Corey up here leading worship for the first time. Thanks so much, our newest member. So, some of our newest members are Corey and Marissa. And so, if you're thinking about becoming a membership, be forewarned, you'll have to lead worship the next week. So, there you go. <laughs> We've, we've been doing a series uh, through the book of Acts, so if you want to grab a Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2, we'll be in Acts chapter 2 in just a second. I want to do a little bit of an intro before, just warm us up to the topic that we have at hand. We've been doing a series called, Is Jesus Really Alive? It's kind of showing different ways, different ways that Jesus proves that he's still alive. And one of those ways that he proves that he's alive is that he's just alive in us. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. Let me pray. And then we'll get into it. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thanks for being with us and in us and among us. We ask that you would continue to speak to us and encourage us, strengthen us for the days ahead. Give us hope and peace. Give us wisdom and gratitude, all the things that make life wonderful. We pray that we would continue to receive those from you. Most of all, we want to know you. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one of the struggles that pastors had a couple of years ago when COVID started to die down was figuring out how to get people to go to church again. Uh, people, I don't know if you noticed, but people got pretty comfortable sitting in their PJs, kind of watching church online, maybe singing along to a worship song or two, having their coffee whenever they wanted. And just like it was hard for employers to get people back into work, it was really challenging to get people to want to come back into church. Maybe you felt that way too. Was it hard for you? No, good. Well, some of you are extroverted. That's great. All right. And that's, that's awesome. No, you're wrong. No, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, it's not like it's a new problem, though, right? Getting people to show up to church has been a challenging issue, for, at least for the last 50 years. Getting people to show up has been a real issue. Some people are like, why would I want to go there? I don't get anything out of it anyway. It's kind of boring. I already know that stuff. A little bit boring. What would be the reason to go? Have you... Have you heard that before? You heard that, maybe not you, Marissa, but other people have said that kind of stuff. When pastors tried getting people back in a church, they felt like the only thing they could do was go to that one famous verse in Hebrews. You remember what that one famous verse in Hebrews says? Do not neglect the forsaking together of the brethren, of the saints, right? It's like we got this one Bible verse, and we tell people, if you stop going to church, you're breaking the rule. There's one rule. And how compelling is that to most people? For a lot of people, it's not that compelling because it feels like it's just a rule, and we know how Americans feel about rules. Yeah, they're like, ah, you know, I want freedom. I don't want rules. And I get it should be compelling, right? You should be like there's a Bible verse. It says it. We should do it. But for a lot of people, it wasn't really that compelling. What did people need? Rather than just one verse commanding them to go, what did they need to get them off the couch and to start showing up again? Hunger? That was good. Spiritual hunger. Yes. Loneliness, despair. They needed a good thing and a bad. They need that. What else did they need? Those are good. Motivation. Motivation. How do you get motivation? That is a great question. Great question. What should pastors have tried doing? Teaching. What should they have taught about? (laughs) Donuts. Yeah, that gets me off the couch. I'm sorry? They need to be seen. Okay. Probably what they, know, they need to know that they're going to be seen in love. They have an, a motivation. They have an expectation that when they show up here, something's going to happen. What they need really is an ins- inspiration, right? It's some kind of motivation. They need some kind of vision. Most of us are driven by a vision. We're driven by a desire. Like I have a need, maybe I have hunger. There's a vision out there that that thing can feed me. That thing out there can fulfill some desire that's inside of me. The motivation that we should have for showing up is a vision that Jesus is alive in the church. That he's here. And if I want to be close to him, I come here with these people. The closest you will ever get on earth to being with Jesus is being with his people. A lot of people, a lot of Christians, don't think that that's true. A lot of Christians think, when I'm on the mountains... Or when I'm having a cup of coffee in the morning and I'm cozy under the blanket, that's when I'm closest to God. But that's not true. Biblically, that's not true. You're closest when you're with the people of God worshiping Jesus. Where two or three are gathered, 
That's where Jesus is. Not you alone having an experience at a concert or something like that. It's when you're with the people of God, worshiping Jesus, you are with him. Right? And rather than saying, we shouldn't be saying, why should you go to church, right? That's wrong. All of you are theologically informed. You know it's not right to say, go to church. What should we say? We should say, instead of going to church, hey, go be the church. Right? Go be the church with those people because you are bringing the presence of Jesus with you. You are contributing something. You're bringing something here. So a lot of Power Ranger fans out there. You don't want to just be a Power Ranger. What do you want to be? The Dino Megazord, which is when all the Power Rangers come together and they create a super one, which has the Power Ranger force inside of it. It's kind of like that. Mm. That'll preach, people. That's right. Feel free to tweet that if you need to. All right. That's great. So we are, we are coming together, and the Bible, the Bible says, like, when, when Jesus is alive, he is alive in us and with us, and that's one of the reasons we come together. When you come together and you meet with Jesus, what you're going to get is you're going to receive the truth of Jesus. You're going to receive the love of Jesus. You're going to receive the generosity of Jesus. And you're also going to be able to give those things. You're going to be able to give his truth. You're going to be able to give his love. You're going to be able to give his generosity to others. You're going to be able to contribute to other people experiencing the presence of Jesus in our midst. Sound good? All right, that's us. So Acts 2, verse 42. What we've been talking about is when Jesus shows up, sorry, when, when Jesus is alive, he proves himself to be alive by continuing to do the things that he did when he was on earth before, right? And so what, what we see in the church is Jesus continuing to do the very things that he did on earth. And so when we read Acts 2, 42 to 47 together, be thinking to yourself, how does this show me what Jesus himself did before? Sound good? Here we go, Acts 2, 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, what kinds of things do you see in there that the church does together that Jesus did when he was on earth? Eating. Eating. Jesus ate with a lot of people. That's significant. I'm going to spend a whole bunch of time on that one. That's great. Number two. Meeting needs. Great. So he's generously meeting needs. That was my my third point of my sermon. Great. Someone else has got to get my first point. There's one other thing they do. They do signs and wonders, which we've talked about for the last five weeks. We're going to skip that one in this sermon. And they gave their possessions as part of generously giving. So I'm going to lump those together in point three. (laughs) Prayer, they did that. That's in point two. They prayed for each other. That's great. Teaching. Great. Wonderful. All right. So Jesus did a lot of things. He taught, he loved, and he gave. He taught, he loved, and he gave. Now, when you read Acts 2, what it sounds maybe to you like is like some hippie commune. Everybody's getting together, feeling the vibes, giving their, poor, giving their money away to each other. And it's like, oh my gosh, it sounds like utopia. Kind of, but not really. Not really. What Luke is doing is something much bigger than that. He's actually painting a picture for us of the fulfillment of tons of prophecies that had come before this. And one of them I'm going to read to you. That is, that God had always desired to be with his people. And most people throughout ancient history thought that God's only showed up in temples. That's where they really were. The Jewish people were the same. They thought, we've got to build a temple because God's holy. He needs dedicated space just for him. But what's deficient about a little box on the earth for the God who made everything? Just the size, right? It's just not quite big enough, right? No box is going to be big enough for God. And so what God envisioned his people was, he said, one day I'm going to build a temple, but it's not going to be made out of bricks or gold or anything like that. It's going to be made out of my people, and my people are going to be the temple, and it's going to be expansive around the whole earth. And so one of those prophecies I'm going to read from Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 4, 
the vision of the new temple, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because, because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in her midst. What's the wall made of? Fire. And where will God be? In the midst. And where is this going to take place? Jerusalem. So the city of God is going to be this enormous thing with God in the midst, with a wall of fire all around. What happened at the beginning of Acts chapter 2? The fire of God came down in which city? In Jerusalem. And it spread all around them so that they could take the fire of God with them every day. And who was in their midst? God himself was in their midst. What God is saying in this, seg- in this little segment of Acts 2 is, I'm fulfilling that prophecy that you will be my holy city on the earth. You will be my people, and there will be no walls. Why not? Because the city's going to go all around the earth. Every single village all around the earth is going to be filled with people who trust Jesus, and Jesus is going to be in their midst. And when he's in their midst, he's going to do these amazing things. It's going to be a different kind of city. It's going to be an amazingly different kind of city. Maybe you've noticed that some cities operate differently than other cities. Maybe. Have you ever noticed that your Belinda thinks differently than Santa Monica? You know? Why is that? Why do those places think so differently from each other? It has to do with their educational systems, right? They educate each other, not just in the schools, but... The stuff that they watch, the stuff that they read, the people that are around, educate them to think a certain way and they all move in a certain direction together, one direction or another. How much different would the city of God be? Because of our educational system, because of the way we train each other, we're going to think differently, we're going to feel differently, we're going to have different desires and different goals. And so, step number one, when Jesus is present with us, he's going to teach us. That's what verse 42 says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What, what, the, what the believers wanted to do when they were going to be the city of God, the temple of God on earth, is they said, we're going to have to think differently than everyone out there. We're going to have to be retrained. What does the apostles' teaching consist of? Where do we find the apostles' teaching today? In this book, right? They wrote this book, right? It's our training manual. It's kind of like our city planning guide or something like that. Like we're going to be built up based on this book. And what the apostles did back in the day is they showed people how Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament promises and prophecies. All the pictures of God's heart are fulfilled in Jesus. He is the climax of all that all the God was pointed to. And then they showed people how to live the way of Jesus. They showed people how to follow him into their everyday lives. And basically what the apostles were doing was training people how to think differently than every other city on earth. That's why Jesus spent 50% of his time, at least recorded in the Gospels, spends 50% of his time teaching, training people. You're going to have to think differently. You're going to have to feel differently if you're going to be a citizen and member of this society. Right? We're, this, we're the city that's called after Jesus, and that's why if you're going to be part of this city, you need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and to be filled with his spirit so that you can be under his leadership and led by his spirit to really feel like you fit in in this community. All right, so when we describe who we are as a church, We are a people who are devoted to the apostles' teaching. We're devoted to the Bible. We're a people of the book, this book. And we want to be built up in it and strengthened by it. Is that what you want? That's what I want as well. Now, when I say we're a people of the book, I don't mean I'm just going to preach really long sermons, right? What does it mean to be a people of the book? What does it mean to come together and to be devoted to the apostles' teaching? It means that there's an expectation that all of us are going to contribute in some way to sharing the truth of God with one another. I don't know how many times this has happened to me, where I get done, Sunday morning, I'm talking to someone, hey, how was Sunday for you? And they're like, oh my gosh, it was amazing. And I'm like, 
what up? Must have been a good sermon. And then they immediately follow up with, because when Brooke said, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm sure. And then she said this right before a sermon, or right, right before a song. It was amazing. Or when Micah opened up with this verse, it really touched me. Or when Donna was praying for me, or when whatever was going on, someone spoke the truth of God to me. And it extremely rarely is it just me. It's usually someone else in the community who is sharing the truth of God with each other. That's why we read, why Luke read those verses earlier today, that when you show up, one of you brings a, a revelation, you bring a teaching or a lesson, some of you brings a song, you're bringing some kind of truth into this conversation, and you're showing up saying, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring something today. To me, having that kind of a mindset where you're showing up ready to give is a cure to a common problem that I hear all the time. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, ah, I'm not really getting anything out of that church anymore. I've heard that sermon before. I've read that Bible verse before. I've sung that song too many times. Just not getting anything out of it anymore. And a lot of times when people hear that, when people start saying that to themselves, what they conclude is, I should probably leave. Maybe go find another church where I'll get something out of it. Or maybe I should just stop going to church altogether. I can get way better teaching online anyway. And I would just like to challenge you. You're going to have that feeling. I, I've had that feeling in my life as well. I'd just like to challenge you to, to just transition. If, if there's nothing to consume here, then be a contributor. Instead of thinking, what can I get out of this? Think, what can I give out of this? Where, what can I bring? If you've heard that sermon before, then you probably have some amazing thoughts to add. In the conversations afterward, like, oh yeah, John was teaching on Acts 2.42. You know what else we know about that verse? You know what else I know about the book of Acts? It's blah, 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 and I'd like to encourage you. If you've heard that song so many times, write a new one. Bring it. That could be a good thing, depending on your skills, right? It could be a terrible thing. Maybe we won't sing it, but whatever. You know, write something, you know? If you've already heard that verse before, then Pray. Pray that verse over people. And the way that's going to happen, like the majority of the time, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to be asking you to stand up and give a five-minute sermon if you're bored. I'm not probably going to do that. But you're going to make the most out of the gaps that 15 minutes before the service starts, 15 minutes after, greeting time, when we encourage you to pray for each other. What you do is you show up and you say, God, who do you want me to bless today? Who do you want me to talk to? Who do you want me to pray with? Who can I contribute to? How can I build this group of people up? We're trying to contribute to the lives of one another. And that's what we get. When, that's, when Jesus tried to train his people, he, didn't, he wasn't the only one who talked. He trained the disciples to also train each other so they could be built up. Great. That's point number one. Point number two, if you, sorry, if you want to be, if you want to know why you should come to church, you should come to church because you're going to get this, the truth of God and you're also going to be able to give it. So point number two then is, if, you want to, if you're asking why to come to church, come to church so that you can experience the love of God. So you can feel it and have a tangible representation of the love of God in your life. And that's what, the, that's what these guys were doing back in the day. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayers. If you jump down to verse 46... And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Why are they eating so much? Why are they talking about food? What does food communicate in an ancient world? What does it communicate now? Fellowship. It's a fancy word for what? What's that? Hospitality. Great. Intimacy, connection. What else does it communicate? Those are all great answers and true ones. That's good. Care. Concern, especially if you're really good at cooking. It's really caring. I think. Community. Great. So those are all excellent answers. Have you, you know that Jesus, when he lived on the earth, people called him a prophet. He was called a prophet, and prophets don't just speak, they act. And all their actions are messages as well. And maybe you've never thought about that in light of all the times that Jesus has shown at a meal. That he's showing up at dinner parties all over the place. 
He's showing up to weddings. He's making breakfast for people. He's eating dinner at someone's house. He's picking food off, the, whatever. He's constantly eating with people. What kinds of people was he eating with? Everybody, all kinds, right? Some people that you'd expect him to hang out with, like religious leaders. Some people you wouldn't expect him to hang out with, like irreligious people. Sometimes he's hanging out with Jewish people who are like his same ethnic group. Sometimes with people who are not part of the same ethnic group. He's hanging out with all kinds of people. What's he trying to communicate every time he has one of those meals? You're important to me. What else? You said that, Colin. Great. What else is he trying to say? That's a good answer. I love you. What else is he trying to say? Those are great answers. Great. I want to be close to you. I mean, the fact that God chose to come to earth in the first place is an amazing thing. Celebrities come to our city often, but they don't come over for dinner. Right? Because they're usually coming to say, I want to be celebrated. And he's saying, I want to be with you, which is a very different and deeper message. God's saying in each of those meals, I'm here to be the presence. Sorry, Jesus is saying, I'm here to be the presence of God with you. You need to know that God wants to be with you because God loves you. God thinks it's important to him that he's with you to take care of you, to bless you, and to have friendship with you. That's a huge message. And one of the things that Christianity tries to do is to proclaim that God is love. And that's a very big deal. It's very different from many other religions. It's one thing to say it, but how much better if someone can actually feel it and experience it through eating with you? Jesus is trying to embody himself in you by challenging you to have meals with people. So that they're not just hearing about God's love and maybe thinking that they're feeling it while they're on a mountain somewhere, but tangibly experiencing the hug of God, so to speak, when they spend time with you. Yeah, I like it. That's right. Even, even in the last days, right, he eats a meal on the, the night before he dies, and then he goes right up to his father, and the next time we see him, we're going to eat together. It's great. It's very true. And God's trying to say that you can be the practical embodiment of Jesus right now, because we can say all we want, God is love, God is love, all we want. But until we get in a room with people and listen to them and talk with them and share their pain with them, God's love is going to feel a little bit distant. We have the opportunity to bring God's love close to people by eating with them, by spending time with them. When we gather together on a Sunday, when we gather together as community groups, we have an opportunity to be a tangible feeling of God's love. Like you're actually going to experience it right here and right now. Why, why, did, why should we spend so much time listening to people as they share about their problems? Because Jesus listened to people while they shared their problems. Why should I listen to people share their worries and their concerns? Because Jesus listened to people share their worries and concerns. Why should I stay up late listening to someone and then praying for them? Because Jesus did that very same thing. And why did he do each of those things? Because he loves those people. And if we want to show people that Jesus loves them, that we get in there. And it's weird to say, but it, when people get together with us, they should feel something like, God loves me. These people are spending time with me. That must mean that God loves me. I'm feeling something beyond just the fact that these people are nice. I'm feeling like God loves me. We've had a few people in our church do this really excellently, I think. They have just gone out of their way in awesome ways, where they've had dinner parties where, where they have hosted a bunch of neighbors. All these neighbors didn't trust Jesus, and the, the host was the awkward one at the party. <laughs> Everyone else got along because they're like, yeah, we're all on the same page, and the host was like, oh, my gosh. You know? like, that's an amazing amount of love. And then there came a time when there was a little bit of a, you know, conflict in the neighborhood, and they're like, but we know that this person loves us. Even though we have disagreements, we know that this person loves us because they've had us into their home so often. 
We can be that for people. So why should you show up on Sundays? You show up so that you can receive the love of God through these people. But also you show up so that you can give the love of God. The person who says, I'm not going to show up on Sundays because I don't get anything out of it is failing to realize that someone might have been coming that Sunday just to see them because they wanted to be encouraged by them, they wanted to be blessed by them, they wanted to be talked to by them. You come in order to give the love of God to these other people. It's one of the reasons why we're, Nikki announced that we're going to have community groups starting up in a couple weeks, which is awesome. You should absolutely join one. Because it's just another way. It's not just Sundays. Church, church isn't Sundays. Church is supposed to be kind of a family experience that we have all week long. We're on mission together in our neighborhoods and workplaces and things like that. So you join a community group, and I get it. It's awkward. Especially the first few weeks, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm supposed to like these people. And it feels totally forced, and I understand that. We do, we do community groups in two semesters. Usually we do a fall one, do a spring one. And it may be the case that for about 10 weeks, you feel super awkward, like, I don't know if I should show up again. But you do. And then what happens if you go most of those, most of those weeks, and then you go in January when you start up again? When you go that first week of January, you're like, my old buddies. Suddenly, you got these friendships, and you feel like you've known these people forever. I like to say that community groups are like a launch pad for real friendship, right? They usually don't feel like real friendship right away, but eventually it starts to feel that way. They're just a tool that we use. So we would just encourage you, come on, get into it, join one of these groups so that you can build friendships and so that you can have a place and a people that you can be loved by and that you can give some of the love of God to. All right, that's our second reason. The third one is the one that Luke spends the most time talking about, which is pretty awesome, because Luke wrote both of his books to a really rich Christian, and so he talks the most about money than uh, any other gospel writer, and pretty much anyone in the Bible, he just loves talking about money, which is great, and this is what he says in verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Then if you could jump over to chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, we're going to read verse 32. This is another really famous description of the church, Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There wasn't a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each one as any had need. And then there's a story about a guy named Joseph who did that. It sounds a little bit wild, doesn't it? Everyone want to sell their house today? Maybe not. It's not a command. It's not like you have to do that. But it was a vision of something that was going on. And what they're doing is they're basically saying, We know that Jesus is an incredibly generous God. He was all, when he was on earth, he was super generous. And so what we should expect is that he'd be incredibly generous through the church as well. How have you seen Jesus be generous? Well, like every single thing that you've ever eaten, he paid for, right? So you're welcome for that free meal. And all the times you've breathed, that was his oxygen. So Once again, you're thank you. You you can thank him for that. Now, he also bought the land that you live on. He owns that, which is cool. And he also gave you your job. That was really nice of him. He's a very good networker and figure out how to get you a job. In addition to that, every single good gift you've ever had has been a gift from him. That's really generous. And so it it shouldn't surprise you that when Jesus was on earth, he was constantly expressing the generosity of God. In what ways did you see Jesus be generous while he was on earth? Yeah, he paid for the alcohol for a week-long wedding. And he didn't pay for it. He just made it, (laughs) which is awesome. Okay, what else did he do? Yeah. Yeah, he was very generous with his time, staying up late, hanging out with people. When he was already tired, he's still constantly giving. How else was he generous? That's good. I'm sorry? With healing, even when it was tiring for him to keep praying for people. Now, we know that the healing was just done with a word, but he still says he gets tired from praying and spending time with people. 
It's kind of a wild mystery. Who knows how to explain that one? Yep. He gave his life for us. Now, that's the ultimate gift, right? He bought your tickets into God's home, which is a wonderful thing, right? He paid the ultimate price so that you could come into his family. With that kind of generosity, if we are going to live as if he's continuing to do the same things on earth as he did back then, we also should be incredibly generous people. And what's amazing about Jesus is that he looked poor. He didn't have a home to sell. He didn't have a car to sell. He didn't have a phone to sell. He didn't have any life insurance or any kind of shares and stocks or whatever to sell. He had nothing he could sell. And yet he constantly was able to give, which is an amazing thing. Now, this is what what the church is called to as well, that we're called to be a radically generous people. Do you know anyone who's been radically generous with their money or with their time, with their resources, with their talents? My, my dad was a pastor for 50 years. He preached a lot of sermons, and he used me as an illustration more often than not and never asked my permission, so payback. My parents, my parents, especially in the last year, two years, have been so incredibly generous with their home. They have been just lending it out to people, lending it out, letting people stay for a weekend, for a week, for many weeks, for many months, and just letting them come in, you know, letting people come in, people they don't know, people they kind of know, people they've never met, whatever. It's, it's been crazy, and it's a huge sacrifice. If you have nice stuff and you like your place clean, it's a big sacrifice to generously allow people to come in, and they've been doing that, and that's been awesome. Other people that are in this church have been giving of their talents. We have some people who are not here right now who have been helping people with their skills. I won't say which skills they are, and they're awesome people, and I'm looking at some of them. They have just been giving other time and energy and saying, hey, I'm going to help you. I want to give. I want to use what God has given to me so that you can have what you need to get your life back together or to get off the ground financially, whatever it is. Like God has called us to be a radically generous people. This church has been amazingly generous with each other. When there's a need for a meal train, you guys are like, ah, let's get in, get in the meal train. When there's like time to move someone, it's like everybody shows up. When it's time to do like a home repair thing, everybody shows up for that. And it's just been awesome. And what you're doing when you do that is you're saying, Jesus is alive. And he's alive in us. And you're going to experience through us what people in Nazareth experienced 2,000 years ago. You're going to experience what it was like to be next to the creator of the world. And I may not have a lot of money. You may not have a lot of money. But we can still be generous with Jesus because he has all the money in the world. And he can constantly give through that. I feel bad for people who don't come to church. I feel bad for them because they're distancing themselves from the truth of God. They're distancing themselves from the love of God. They're distancing themselves from the generosity of God. And they don't think that they're doing that. They probably don't realize that that's what's happening. But if you choose not to be part of the church, you're basically saying, I'm not going to have as much of God's truth in my life. I'm not going to have a feeling of God's love and an expression of God's love regularly in my life. I, you know, you're going to get some of that at the beach. You're going to get some of that in nature it's when you read the Bible, of course. But you're not going to have it tangibly with you on a regular basis. And you're distancing yourself from the generosity of God. You're distancing yourself from his ability to give you, through his church, his resources, his network, his talent, his time, his energy. All that comes through the people of God. So come and be the church, right? You have an opportunity when you show up here not just to receive, but also to contribute, to give, and to say, you know what, I want to actually help people hear the truth of God. So I'm going to come with a message. I'm going to come with something to pray. I want people to feel the love of God. So I'm going to come asking God, like, God, who should I talk to this morning? Who needs a friend? Who needs a hug? Who needs a smile? I'm going to come asking him, Who can I give to this morning? 
I'm going to come looking, like maybe with a few extra bucks in my pocket, which, I mean, this has happened to me before, where someone says, I show up with X amount of dollars in my pocket and just pray, God, who should I give this to? Which is wild. If it's five bucks or if it's 5,000 bucks, both are received with gratitude when you give, just so you know. Uh, I've been the recipient of both of those at different times, and it was hilarious. It's like, that's awesome. God is amazing. Come show it ready to say, I want to give. Like, maybe you have a talent, and you're like, I'm going to give. I want it. Like, I wonder who could use the skills that I've got. I'd love to come and bring that. All right, anyone have a question? Yeah, Andrew. How do you encourage the believers in other churches that don't have that experience? Who haven't received that way. Now, I, I'm glad you brought that up. So if we're really supposed to be, like the hands and feet of Jesus, as Corey said earlier, if we're supposed to be an expression of God's love in this midst, that would explain why church hurt hurts more than almost any other hurt, right? Because you're supposed to be receiving God's love, and if you haven't, you're like, even God doesn't love me. That's real painful. And I would cry with those people, just lament with them. I am so sorry that's the case. I wish that that weren't the case. And then I would maybe, if I had, if I wanted to say, I'd like to change that for you. I'd like to be the person who changes that. Or... I'd like our community group to be the person, the group that changes that. I'd like our church to be the church that changes that. I'd like us to be challenged to change that as well. I, by God's grace, I haven't heard people say that about our church community. But if you hear that, let me know. I'll wag my finger. Just kidding. I won't do that. Be like, oh, try to exhort us again once again. Like, let's be that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, generosity is a two-way street. So how do you find out about needs? And that is so challenging. So it takes humility on our part. We have to be the kind of people who are willing to say, I've got a problem, right? I need prayer for something. It's one of the reasons why we ask people like, hey, stand over here and you know, be ready to pray. Stand in the back and be ready to pray for people. And I would just encourage you to receive prayer. Even if you only feel like 1% I need the prayer, that will help other people have the courage to stand up and get prayer. If you have a need and you're like, you know what, I could probably do this job by myself, but why? I'm going to ask someone to help me out. Doing that kind of stuff is extremely helpful. It's actually, it's, it's actually really helpful if you've got problems, yeah. right? It helps everybody if you've got issues because we are all looking for ways and places to be generous and helpful, and we can't seem to ever find anyone who needs it, right? And so if you could just have a problem every once in a while, Tell me about it. Tell everyone around, around you about it. Something like that. That would really help us out. Yeah, so if you're in a community group, let your community group leader know. Sometimes they'll find out. Sometimes we'll, like, a community group leader will find out, and they ask, hey, is it okay if we share this with the broader church? They might let me know, and then we could kind of you know, network a little bit and figure out who can be a solution to the problem that you've got going on as well. That's a good question. Anyone else? All right, so we are called by God to be the place where Jesus is alive, right? And that means that we are going to speak the truth of God. We are going to be expressors of the love of God. We are going to be the generosity of God. We're also going to be the place where we receive those things from God. And so just encourage you, show up. Be part of the church. Be part of a community group. Show up to our prayer meetings and things like that. All right, now, it seems to me like the best way for us to respond right now would be to pray for each other. So let's do some of that. Why don't we spend a minute? I would just like to encourage you in this way. Why don't you get a group of three or four around you? And if you're not comfortable praying, that's fine. There will be people in your group who will be comfortable praying. Um, let them do the praying. But pray just truth over the person. And what that means is stuff like God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is coming back for you. Jesus has all the resources that you need. Jesus covers your shame. Jesus uh, wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. That, those are all true things that we could pray over each other. So I just encourage us to pray for a minute or two, and then we'll sing together. And then after that, we'll have a few people in the back who would be willing to pray for you. So um, I know Kimmy would like to do that. Billy would like to pray for people in the back as well. So Billy would be over here. Um, Kim will be over here. Maybe Hannah, do you mind praying for people as well? So Hannah will be back in the middle. And so I would encourage you, let today be the day that you receive prayer. 
Um, but let's begin just by praying with each other and, and trying to encourage each other in that way.